Yeah, let me begin my talk tonight with a little story about a friend of mine who went on vacation and then came back and posted some photos of herself in a beach wearing a bikini. She's a big woman like myself, and soon after she posted it, comments started pouring in from people shaming her body, her choice of outfits. But one comment in particular stood out to me, and it was from another woman. And she said, she wrote with lots of flowers and heart emojis, so I figured she sounded a little sweet like this. She said, <clears throat> my dear, you are such a beautiful woman, but your beauty belongs to your husband and your husband only. If other men see as much as a strand of hair, you are definitely going to hell. Don't you just love it when someone tells you you're going to hell, but they do it in such a sweet way, you think you have to thank them for it? <laughs> anyway, my friend replied, thank you, mind your own business, and this woman replied back and she said, oh, don't worry about me, I wear a hijab so I know I'm on the right path. But it's my duty as a Muslim woman to remind other Muslim women when they're out of line. I am a Muslim myself, but this trend of hijab-wearing women shaming women who don't cover up is gaining massively in Indonesia lately. But that is a topic for another talk. Meanwhile, let's go to France. In France, a woman in a beach wearing a Muslima swimsuit. The media calls it a burkini, but none of us Muslims really know what a burkini is. But, <coughs> <laughs> but she was forced to take off her head cover by armed policemen. In countries where Islamophobia is ripe, hijabis get verbally harassed, even assaulted, for the choice that they make on their own bodies. So, whether it's the body shaming done by Muslims in Indonesia or done to Muslims in the US or France or wherever, one thing is consistent. It's always women's bodies that become the object of scrutiny. Now, I see a lot of us here are females, and when you're born female, you will be raised with your body as the center of your world from day one. For example, here in Indonesia, and maybe in some other cultures as well, we have this tradition of piercing the ears of newborn baby girls with tiny gold earrings because we think, well, how else are people going to identify that she's female if she's not adorned with pretty jewelries? We weren't old enough to even sit up straight and already our identity is determined by how beautiful we adorn our bodies. You know, it feels as if we're living inside this beauty pageant that we never sign up for, where everybody else gets to be the judge. Everybody gets to say what to do, what not to do, how to look. Everybody gets to say about our bodies, except for ourselves. Another thing we are quite obsessed about is virginity. Not men's virginity, though, just girls and women, so you guys are safe. <laughs> Again, here in Indonesia, for example, we have certain institutions like the police department, the military, certain schools that have been reported to conduct virginity tests on their personnel and their female students to determine their moral quality. We're also taught to guard our virginity until marriage, right? Familiar with that? Any Indonesians here? We're supposed to guard our virginity until marriage, but not because we choose to, but because our virginity belongs to our husbands. And later when we marry, we have this expectation placed upon us to melayani, to serve our husbands, including sexually, whenever he wants. Now, my journey as a musician began in the early 90s. And I used to hate it when people asked me my experience as a female musician, because I thought, well, female, male, as long as you work hard and you write good music, you'll succeed, right? It's not about the gender. But that was until I was almost signed into a record label, and this was about maybe 10 years ago, and we were having a meeting with the record label people, 
and the marketing guy asked me, can you gain 10 to 15 kilograms in a month? This was 10 years ago, so I was probably a little smaller than I am today. Can you gain 10 to 15 kilos in a month? And I asked him why. And he said, well, we can either market you as a hot singer or a fat singer. You definitely don't fall into the hot singer category, so let's just plump you up and sell you as a fat singer. Basically, that's what he's saying. <laughs> I didn't go through with the deal and I decided to pursue my career in the independent music scene, which, which suits me better. But a few years later, I ran into the same guy at a music event and um, he was talking to a bunch of aspiring musicians, aspiring producers and music directors, and he said, sexy is out, demure is in. The market no longer wants a pop star that they can masturbate to. They want a pop star that looks like wife material, is what he said. So I jumped in and I asked him if that theory of his applies to male pop stars as well. And he couldn't really give me a straight answer. So these things are how I know that the playing field was never level. When boys want to be musicians, they got to worry about how well they play, how well they write songs. When girls, like myself, want to be musicians, we got to worry about how well we play, how good we sound. We also got to worry about how desirable we look, how hot and sexy we look according to this industry standards. Now, when I tell you all these things, please don't think that these are just problems that are specific to Indonesia. Because your country, wherever you're from, you probably have your own misogynistic culture and practices as well. In fact, Indonesia, going back in history, have had women leaders, women war commanders, women holding important positions in society like uh, healers and educators and holders of knowledge, going back hundreds of years, way before the concept of feminism was even invented. But right now, now, in this day and now, we are living under a culture of patriarchy, and it's a global problem. So no matter where you're from, you will find women's bodies being shamed, being regulated, being exploited, or objectified in one way or another. Women's bodies are used as political leverage. It's used to sell products, or worse yet, we are the product itself. In 2013, I went on a road trip by myself and I was in a night bus in Sumatra, traveling alone. And I noticed I was the only woman in the bus. And I noticed I was being stared at. I was terrified. Because not long before that, there was news about a woman in India who was gang raped and murdered in a bus, just like that one. So my first response was to check if I was covered up enough, if my leg was revealed, if my shirt was unbuttoned. I put on a jacket, I put on a hat, even though it was steaming hot inside the bus. I have to make myself as invisible as possible. But inside, I was really, really angry that as a woman, I have to constantly limit myself just to be safe. Don't go out at night, don't travel alone, don't go out at all. I have to, I can only wear certain kinds of clothing to be treated with basic respect. So, in that anger, mixed for fear for my safety, I pulled out a pen and a paper and I started writing the lyrics to what is now a song called Tubuhku Otoritasku, My Body, My Authority. Ini suaraku, tubuhku, otoritasku. This is my body, my voice, my authority. Yang ku teriakan, kenakan pilihanku. What I wear, what I say is my choice. And I kept writing and I kept writing and I felt bigger and stronger and I made it through that trip safely. At the end of TEDx, later I will perform with my band that whole song. <laughs> so stick around, don't, don't go anywhere. <laughs> anyway, in 2016, I joined forces with four fabulous women activists. This is Ika, Shira, Fina, and Tera. Please give a round of applause even though they're... <laughs> <out here. laughs> and together we formed a collective called Mari Jeng Rebut Kembali. <laughs> which literally means ladies reclaiming our rights back. And together we produce a music video for Tubuhku Autoritasku, where we invited 36 women 
to come and make a statement about their own body according to their own experience in their own words and written on their own skin. And the result was incredibly powerful. We have Rika, a hijabi who says, Tubuhku bukan penjaga imanmu. My body is not the guardian of your faith. Because even though she wears a long hijab which supposedly keeps her safe from sexual harassment, she still gets sexually assaulted. We also have Alexa, a transgender woman who says, my body, my choice, tubuhku pilihanku, at a time when the LGBTQ community is under attack, it is still under heavy attack in Indonesia. We even have a fat woman, AKA myself, showing her belly, which is considered very offensive to some people. So, the response we got for this video is incredibly amazing. It was beyond our expectations. We have negative ones and we have positive ones, but who would have thought that a video of just women claiming things about her own body could be so controversial, but then, then again, it may be controversial in a culture that wouldn't let women do that. We have had comments, emails, letters from bigots from Indonesia to Malaysia to the US of A. You put these guys in a room together, they'll murder each other but you add a feminist in there, they will unite against her. <laughs> There's a lot more in common to these people than they think. Anyway, <laughs> but the positive response that we got was also beyond our expectations. Tubuhku Autoritasku opened ways for me to meet with all kinds of people. I've met with survivors of eating disorder who said that they listen to the song every day and it makes them uh, love themselves again. I've met with high school students who said that ever since watching the video, they've been reluctant about taking diet pills and whitening injections. I've met with survivors of rape who says that she listens to the song every morning to help empower her and embrace herself again. I receive letters from a single mother in Estonia. I've never even been to Estonia. And then a school teacher in Japan and a father of three children in China, all saying that the song have helped them to empower themselves in different ways. Some people in the media says that the song is about giving a middle finger to the diet industry and some others call it a feminist anthem. Some others say that it's a song that speaks out against domestic violence. But whatever the inter interpretation, I see one thing that is consistent about people who relate with Tubuhku Autoritasku. This song is about women reclaiming our bodies. We take back what was initially ours to begin with. My body is mine and mine only, and how good it feels to finally be able to say that. Thank you.